everyone. Um, I'd like you all to really help me and put questions into Slido. It makes my life a lot easier. Um, for a great pleasure to be here uh, hosting this and doing the interviews. When I was asked to do this, I thought, that's very nice. And then I had that moment. Oh, no, this is a Graham Norton moment. <laughs> what, what is it about having an Irish accent and ending up presenting on television? Um, but uh, hopefully there won't be Sauvignon Blanc or a big red chair. At least not that the audience, not that the panel know about yet. Um, so look, I'm going to kick off with some questions. It's great to see um, some questions beginning to, to co come out. But I'm going to try a couple of just general questions. Please use Slido and we'll, I'll, I'll edit them and um, pick them out as we go. Um, so I just wanted to start off with Kirsty. Um, like any good presenter, I've, I've set up a question first to try and make it a bit easier. <laughs> um, but I, um, we sort of often tell our success stories, things that really um, work, but we often learn most from our failures or our success, uh, than our successful endeavors. Our successful endeavors, we bank and move on. Our failures, we reflect on them. As I woke up at 5.30 this morning, started writing email to my staff about something that went wrong yesterday. Stopped myself at that point. Um, but Christy, do you want to reflect uh, sort of personal failure that you thought uh, and what you changed afterwards? Thanks, Colin. Thanks for letting me start with the uh, difficult questions. That's kind of a question I usually use on an interview panel for someone <laughs> I'm trying to employ to see if they can learn. Um, uh, I think it's an interesting question. I have lots of, oh, my God, this has gone horribly wrong moments. In, in relation to this particular yeah. topic, um, I, I think one of my failures historically is being complicit in, you know, I talked this morning about systems and being complicit in a broken system. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, I've spent sort of over a decade doing individual research projects and individual evaluations and half of them probably have never seen the light of day. They're sitting in someone's drawer in a government ministerial office somewhere um, that have never been publicly released. And, and, and I don't like being complicit in that system. What I learned from that is, is that now, unless I can get a return licence on IP, I won't sign up. Uh, and... Um, and, you know, for me, transparency of information is, you know, one of my key values and it's critically important and I will hand back the money um, in terms of research and, and evaluation projects if someone's not serious about transparency. Any other reflections on things that haven't worked or lessons? I have a ton of things that didn't work, but they don't have to do with data. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll take it. We'll <laughs> They're far more interesting now, but... Yeah. Is my microphone there working now? Yeah. Um, so in terms of failure, there, you know, there are lots and lots of things you can reflect on. And I think, actually, when I think about evidence into action, failure is a really fundamental part of that turning into action. So I think about the times, for example, um, you know, we, take, we can take evidence really, really, really seriously. And if it tells us something's working or not, you know, it can be the, the dead end of something. But actually what we want to keep encouraging is learning and iterating as we go. I mean, maybe I'm just too much of an optimistic person. Um, and we talked a bit about positivity I heard before, um, which is important in this. But um, just reflecting on some of my own experiences where I feel like I have failed around evidence and interaction, and it's particularly been around how as we as Treasury have interacted with people from outside of government. And, um, but every interaction I've had that hasn't quite worked, I've actually learned a massive amount from it. And it's the same as evidence into action. What are we learning from it to help make a better system? Every decision that didn't go our way, what did we take from it to make that a better outcome? And so for me, evidence into action is about that iteration and that learning. So failure, failure spurns innovation as well. So how can we take that approach to it? I would like to add something very quickly. I mentioned this this morning. Uh, the question is exactly right. Uh, we learn a lot from failure, and it's a good thing because we have a lot of failure, especially when it comes to program evaluation. I mentioned the Obama initiatives this morning. In the next five to six months, there will be several hundred programs that have been evaluated around the country, and the results will come back in, many of them from random assignment studies. So we're going to have to pay careful attention to them. And a majority, if the past is any guide, a majority of them will fail. And at that point, I think we have to do, the, one of the most important things we have to do in the next five years, at least in the US, and that is learn, learn how to learn from failure. How can we improve these programs? Not just somebody in Washington saying you ought to do this and that and that, but people out in the countryside who actually run these programs need to learn how to improve them. 
or they'll lose their money. Um, can I just add to this too that um, from my perspective at a personal level, I think I've, um, when I felt that I've let myself down is, um, is when I think the values that I have uh, don't necessarily align with, I guess, some of the decisions or actions I've taken. So for me, it's around your values. Um, in terms of this particular kaupapa and at a tribal level, um, where I have seen, um, when I called it, as I described it, the good, bad and the ugly, and I'll talk about the ugly, is when actually the egos of um, individuals have, I guess, taken over the greater collective good. So. I've seen that happen, and I've seen when people have been burnt, when resources have uh, gone, have not been as effective or efficiently used. And so, you know, those are the sorts of lessons that we have to learn that, again, it's coming back to making our people central to both uh, designing ways forward and the solutions. Uh, just developing on that point, there's a question here, um, and Ron starts to pick it up. Is action about better program or better practice across services? Uh, we tend to think about program evaluation as zero, one, on, off. Um, we'll stop it, we'll start it. But it, how much of it is really about improving our practice and doing, doing small things better every day? I guess a sense of that from Laura earlier today and other speakers. Any reflections on practice versus um, better programs, turning them on and off? Well, there are a lot of ways to fail, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, often it's the program. The program's not really effective, especially in a new setting, but it's the practice as well. It need different personnel, different training, different coaching. A lot of things could change. There's no reason to choose between those two things. It would be a good idea to identify which one is the source of the problem, uh, but it could be either. Christy? Yeah, I don't really have a lot to add. I mean, I, I don't think we should look at the two as separate. It, it can absolutely be either practice and or the program. I mean, I think the thing about we have to be willing to learn from failure. Government, um, and I'm pointing to government here, but government anywhere in any of our countries has to accept that people are going to get things wrong, that programs aren't going to be right. And actually, maybe they could be implemented with the best of intentions and the practice might be perfect. And that doesn't make the organisation a failure, but actually that intervention didn't work and we've got to try something else. I think the other thing about failure and practice versus program um, type of thing is, you know, we need to start from the premise of do no harm. And the challenge in the social sector is, is that we're talking about people and mm. their lives. And so we have to, I think, always sit with that at the fundamental basis of where we start from. And if something's not working, we have to be prepared to stop, to change, to adapt, to amend. Uh, but do no harm, I think, is something we need to hold on to. One thing um, that that I reflect, so this is from you know, uh, looking at a wide range of programs from a treasury perspective. It's one of the luxuries of my job. I get to see across everything that that government does. And when I think about the practice of government, we don't close things down, from what I experience. And you know, when do we face up to that reality of that's actually what we have to do? So so um, how do we deal with that? Which is obviously part of our culture deeply. You know, do we want that to continue or don't we? And otherwise, how do we continuously improve and iterate? So I think there's some things we have to look at in terms of the way we practice and the reality of what we do. Sort of, you know, do we close programs or do we improve them? And do we do any of those things anyway? So um, I think from my own experience, it's been uh, the continuous improvement practice is what I've primarily seen in the public sector happening and working. And uh, that can be in, within the Treasury. I think we've been far better at continuous improvement than stopping things and you know, trying completely new innovations. We'd like to get more on the innovation spectrum, but what is it that keeps dragging us back to a continuous improvement type of... So, yeah, so I guess I'm trying to say, what's the reality versus what we'd like it to be and, and how do we close that gap? Just thinking about, uh, there's a couple of questions here I'm, I'm trying to run together. One I, I giggle at, which is, it was obviously a disparaging remark made about sociology earlier in the day of someone with a sociology degree. <laughs> but it goes to um, what should the new generation, either of young grads or people coming into the field, the evidence field, be focused on? What are the sort of core competencies of the future? What, are we, what will the young grads, the new people in NGOs, in, in EWE organisations, in governments need? What, what are the competencies? Are they any different? Is it just curi curiosity and a, 
a willingness to, to learn or is there, are there technical competencies they should be thinking about? Any reflections on that from academia or from practice or from treasury? But they certainly need skills and uh, I would put research design and statistics right at the top of the list. They have to master that. They also need a lot of experience with programs. I think it'd be a, it's a big mistake to have evaluators that them, don't themselves have a lot of experience in trying to run programs or working closely with programs from some position because they just can't appreciate how difficult it is to run a program without some direct experience. It's not like you can just push buttons and everything falls in place. You could see that from the presentation, at least the one I was in this afternoon, about changing a program and how difficult it is and the problems with personnel and people quit and there are always problems like that. So those kind of things require experience. So it's, I think it's a combination of skills and experience that makes for good program evaluation and reflection on new programs. Um, to add to that, about two and a half years ago, I had the opportunity to go to um, Stanford and to visit Google X. And um, I came away from that experience and what they hammered home to me was around um, certainly having those technical skills, but also all those competencies, um, but also putting yourself in the um, shoes of a customer. So it was very strongly customer focused. And the other part to it too is having an understanding of what the sort of big trends that are coming that are not so far away from us now, like the um, IT, the drones, uh, robotics, and what is that going to do for in terms of our future workforce? So I think having that kind of mindset too is important. Mm. I'd really um, reinforce that, um, being able to put yourself in the customer's shoes. So for me, the word is empathy. And um, I recently went to a super diversity discussion in um, Auckland, and it was so great to get out of Wellington and, you know, go to, you go to Auckland and you go, wow, super diversity is happening right now, and there's all sorts of things about data and evaluation and evidence being needed live time. But all those conversations are about how do we put ourselves in the shoes of others and truly understand that and empathise and bring that back into the technical skilled work we do. And until we do that, uh, we can't collaborate with others. We can't make um, the collective action happen that we have to now do to get to the sort of outcomes we want to achieve. So I think you know, absolute technical skill, but we're requiring now of ourselves the oldies and the youngies, um, that empathy skill as well. The only thing I'll add, and I think we can move on, is um, two things that I think have been missing. Well, well, firstly, let me just say, not everyone can have every skill. And so we have to value that diversity matters enormously and diverse groups can bring great value and great expertise and how we pull together teams, I think, is, is the, the key driver. Um, I, I won't repeat what my colleagues have said here, but... I, but I will add um, two things. One, I think the ability to have difficult conversations is critical. You know, the technical skills absolutely matter as a foundation, but if you can't deal with the adaptive problems, then you get stuck. Mm -hmm. So the ability to have difficult or crucial conversations is really important. And then secondly, communication skills. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's come up, uh, both I've heard today and I heard yesterday in the, the meetings that I was at, at um, is the importance around knowledge exchange, uh, which I actually prefer calling it knowledge exchange and knowledge translation, or, you know, because knowledge exchange is about how you have a reciprocal conversation as opposed to, here, let me tell you what I know. Um, and that's really critical. And how do we translate or exchange information so that people understand it based on where they're at or what they need? Infographics, videographics, you know, um, how do I turn this 300-page report into something that someone wants to read or understands? How do I turn it into a tweet, a this, that, or the other? Communication is, is really critical. Um, quote of the day, it was good to get out of Wellington Treasury Deputy Secretaries. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was worth repeating. Oh, any invites, by the way, uh, <laughs> out of Wellington, I will gladly receive. They don't get invited out often, said the former <laughs> yeah, Treasury right. Deputy Secretary. Um, <laughs> so there was um, there w one of the questions that's here, he says, scrolling, trying to find the actual question, having had his finger on it, is, is the idea that we always run the risk of when we collect data and, and start with evidence that our own intuitions actually dominate how we create the data, how we create the, the, 
the evaluation? You know, how do we manage that sort of strong personal bias, that strong intuition, those strong priors when we start to think about evidence, when we start to think about evaluation? Is there a way of managing that uh, other than through maybe our professionalism? Or is it just our professionalism that helps us manage that natural inclination to find what we want to see in the data or in the evaluation? If you have strong biases, uh, especially when it comes to programs that you like or results yeah. that you favor and so forth, you're in the wrong business. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of people who are highly biased and I would advise they go into become lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, think, I think researchers have to really, they have to have a personal predisposition toward levity and judgment and letting the chips fall where they may, and they need to develop that throughout their career. Bias is really is a, a, an enemy of good evaluation and of evidence-based policy. I do agree, Ron, but since we're on the couch and I can be controversial, um, I think everyone has biases. I mean, it's, it's my job as an academic to be as independent as I possibly can be, but it's also my job to understand what my biases are. I'm female, you know, I'm of a particular ethnic background, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things that we do with our high degree research students is teach them to understand their positionality, which is jargon word for who am I and what am I bringing and what are the biases that I actually are bringing to the table. Um, there's a really nice infographic going around on social media, I don't know how many of you have seen it, with like the 40 types of possible biases that you might have. Um, and it's basically, if you read the organisational kind of leadership and strategy and business literature, it's taking all of the biases that we kind of know about and throwing them into these great little pictures. And it's actually really cool because it's a useful thing to look at and think, well, which ones might I actually have and where am I being blinded and how do I... How do I overcome those biases that, that I might actually start with? So I agree that, it, you know, it's our job to not be biased, but I think that we all come with some, um, some blindfolds and we need to be prepared to understand what those might be. Mm. Um, I just want to give a real example here. And two weeks ago, the release of the first report card on the, I guess, the health of the Waikato and the Waipa River was released. And that, the... the team that came up with those ratings or scores, first time ever, was made up of um, scientists from Niwa, from the Waikato Regional Council, alongside uh, what I would call or consider people with a particular expertise in Mātauranga Māori, Māori knowledge and values, and iwi people. And in the end, they, the report card was released and they made some compromises between what was a C or a C- minus or C plus, and that was where uh, the you know there was a really robust um, exchange of around some of the the biases, and I was really proud that the fact that when that report card, which I have here, was launched by the minister for the environment, um, it came out as a, a a collective scorecard from those groups of different people with different value sets. So it, it is certainly possible. Mm -hmm. Fiona, any reflections from an official's perspective? Yeah, well, I think, again, from a, um, a practical um, experience. So we, we've always run the budget process as a very tight within state sector process. And for this year, for the first time, we thought we needed, um, we needed to check our own unconscious bias in that process as a treasury. So we um, set up a panel that included the science advisors um, and um, people from uh, NGO uh, iwi and philanthropy to come and sit on that panel and provide challenge <coughs> to departments and back to the treasury vote people, the, the, uh, the people who make the spending sort of um, recommendations. And so we're, at, we're using a wider range of expertise and different viewpoints. And boy, did it teach us a whole lot of new things. Um, in fact, it gave us power to our spending uh, control elbow, which we're very, very grateful for. Um, but, but actually, more than that, we got much more practical and better insights. Um, and I think departments have got that too, and, and for um, the capability of our own staff. So I guess we're, we wanted to check our own assumptions and how we look at the world and invite other people in to provide challenge to us. Can I add one thing to this? Um, a situation in which people are especially likely to be biased, I'm from Washington again, where I see a lot of bias, um, is if people have supported a certain reform and then the reform is evaluated and the results start to come in. 
the people who supported the reform, and especially the people who voted for it, no matter what happens, it was a success. That's it. It was a su success. And I have a personal experience here. I played some role uh, in 1995 and 96. Uh, we had a huge debate over welfare reform, and we made very fundamental changes in a welfare program, initiated primarily by Republicans, although it was signed by a Democratic president. And the results started to come in, and the, at first they were really positive, and Republicans had a lot to crow about. But then it turned out that what we did was require, we made very strong work requirements, and if single mothers did not meet the work requirements, they could lose their benefit or have their benefit cut. And many mothers did. And so gradually over the years, the percentage of poor mothers who had a cash benefit declined, declined, declined. That's a failure. That is a failure. That was not the intent. And I have, there are hardly any Republicans that will ever, ever mention that. And if they do, they say it's their own fault. So I, I just, that's one example, but there's so many more of if people are committed to a program, and especially politically, that they will be highly biased in interpreting results. So caveat emptor. The, um, I'm not quite sure how this, this works, but there's a lovely instruction to me. Uh, please ask the question with the most likes. Now, I don't know if you can keep hitting your own question, but I'll ask <laughs> okay. it. So, um, <laughs> but it's very clever, whoever did it. Well done. Uh, should the government, and the, probably to some extent aimed, at, aimed at, uh, at Fiona, should the government be evaluating the impact of its own policies? 100,000 families on benefit, but we have no idea about their outcomes. Off benefit, sorry. Off benefit. So I'm sorry, I can't get, I don't know the specifics about uh, that evaluation process. From a Treasury perspective, we, you know, we absolutely love evaluation <laughs> and we think that evidence and information and data is critical to making good decisions. Um, you know, there's always going to be a divide, isn't there, between the public servants and the political, I mean, we, they're elected to make the decisions, I guess, and as public servants, we're there to make sure they get the best information to make those decisions, we can't make the decisions for them. But yeah, so from Treasury perspective, we are really keen on the evidence and evaluation, but I think it comes back to the point you were making about bias and um, you know, how do you close, when a program's obviously not working, how do you get people to understand and therefore accept something that they've completely committed to and put their heart and soul into? How do you get them to open their eyes and see what's going on? And so. Um, we have to think more smartly as a treasury as well. It's just not a black and white answer about is something working or not. How do we get various forms of information in um, to help with that? So I can't unfortunately answer that about that specific program, but um, you know we're we're very keen on that. If it's not just long-term evidence, it's also feedback loops and other sorts of information that you want to bring as well. Um, I can't help you with the political problem or the political question. But I think, um, I think it's a really important, it's an important question that's been raised. And I, I, the question that I want to ask back if the minister was here was, what are you doing this for? What, what outcome is it that you want to achieve? Remember where I started? What problem are we trying to solve here? Is it an economic one? Is it a social one? Is it a combination? What is it that we're trying to achieve? And if we can work out what problem we're trying to solve, we can work out what fundamentally we need to measure. Let me give you an example of something that we saw happen, not just in Australia, but in other, in other countries. And I think this is a, you know, it's almost that word of warning when you, you, I'm all for stopping stuff that's not working. I think it's a waste of time, effort and energy, and it's just busy work and avoiding the real problem and having that hard conversation. So I'm all for stopping things. So we went through a, a process in Australia and in other countries, including New Zealand, of deinstitutionalisation, when we worked out that segregating people with disabilities and mental illness was not OK, and there were some terrible outcomes, and that was an awful time, I think, in, in our histories. 
Um, so deinstitutionalisation was fairly, um, you know, there, there wasn't a great big, I mean, there was some arguments, but there's not really an argument around we needed to stop deinstitutionalisation. Uh, sorry, institutionalisation. So we deinstitutionalised. The outcome of that is great in that we don't have these big institutions anymore. There are arguably some small institutions. The problem with deinstitutionalisation, if you look at the outcomes in terms of the research, is that we didn't put stuff in its place. So what, what was it that we're, what was the problem we were trying to solve? The problem we were trying to solve was actually for people with disabilities and people with mental illness who are living in institutions, we wanted better outcomes for them. We wanted them to have better lives. We wanted them to be part of community. We wanted them to be able to live, um, you know, and equally access our communities, live in, in housing, be able to access the shops, you know, have families, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We know kind of what we want to achieve and by taking away something that was preventing those things from happening, um, but by not putting anything in its place, led us to a, a history that really we shouldn't be proud of. And we've spent a lot of time and a lot of money trying to correct that with programs that better integrate people with mental health problems and better support people with disabilities to be part of our societies. So what problem is it that we're actually trying to solve and how do we help our ministers, our politicians, our bureaucrats and whoever else stay on that message? And I just want, um, I don't, just um, again, the wonders of um, this, um, just a message from Alan Greenfield, um, just noting that there's a current Subaru sponsored project looking at the outcomes to the answer, where do people when, go when they come off benefit? Does Alan want to make a, any comment on that? Um, well, not really. It's, uh, mm. a question that was uh, posed by uh, Minister Tolley um, and she, um, through our ministerial fund at Superu, um, requested uh, some uh, evidence um, around that through the recent uh, welfare reforms that we've had a few years ago, wanting to better understand what have what what's happened to people as they've come off the benefits. So a variety of different benefits. So yes, there's a that piece of work is underway um, that Superu is doing, and uh, my understanding is probably going to be published about June. And of course, in Supery, we publish everything uh, for transparency. So uh, that that piece of work will come out. Yeah. Okay, we've just got a few minutes left, so I'm going to sort of finish up with a with a classic sort of end of interview question. Uh, look, there aren't any silver bullets to move from evidence to action, but what's the one piece of advice you consistently give to inspire others to stay the course? Because we've got to stay the course. So that sort of one piece of advice, or two pieces of advice, or three, your choice. Any reflections on, you can frame it as, if you could go back and see your younger self, what advice would you give to your younger self? Another version of this. Okay, I'll um, start. Um, think about your children and your grandchildren and the future you want for them. Ron? Uh, I don't have a younger self, I don't think. I can't remember it anyway. So, uh, I, I like that one a lot. Um, but to focus on data and, and research and evaluation and evidence-based policy, we, we hardly know. We're right at the beginning, I think. We're beginning to develop good approaches. We've learned a lot about evaluation. We know a lot of programs that work, but I think we're like 20% into this. We've got 80% to learn. So it's, we need to look forward and anticipate the next steps and build on the field. And within a decade, I think we can really make a difference in many, many social programs. Fiona, anything from? I think for me, it's, um, <clears throat> you know, don't be afraid. Just take a step and, and do it because, you know, you're ambitious and what you want to achieve will lead you in the right direction and and so I think I've often waited for too long for things to be too perfect before I took the step and in fact taking a step even if it's not perfect has often led me in the right direction anyway. Kirsty? Uh, it would probably be stay on purpose. 
look out for opportunities and jump those risks and, uh, and always do that upholding personal values because that's something that nobody can ever challenge, take away from you. So look, I'd like to thank everyone for their contributions. Thank you, audience, for your questions. Sorry I didn't get to all the questions, but there's more questions than I, you can imagine I could, could reasonably get to. Um, so thank you, everyone. It was wonderful insights, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you.